Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Congregation. We exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. Here's a look at this week's announcements. Join us every Monday as we fast and pray corporately. We meet for face-to-face -face prayer between 5.30 and 7 p.m. Please note that every first Monday of the month, the men and women meet separately to pray. We start off together with worship at 5.30 p.m. Thereafter, the men go upstairs. The next meeting will be Monday, the 6th of June. Our Night of Encounters prayer night will be taking place on Friday, the 10th of June at our Dorado Church from 6 p.m. till midnight. Come expectant to encounter the Lord in the anointing of corporate prayer. Let's look to the Lord and His strength and seek His face always. Let's reach out to our community. Join us on a Dorado neighborhood outreach taking place on Saturday the 18th of June from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. All are welcome from all ages. Contact Auntie Katrina on 081-842-3166 for further details. Our intercession ministry will be hosting a prayer camp weekend from the 8th to the 10th of July at Rock Lodge. If you want to learn to pray, grow in your prayer life, or you already love prayer, this camp is for you. Teachings will be by Pastor Eric Bapatel, our Every Nation Southern Africa Prayer Director. Cost of the camp is $1,420 Namibian dollars per person, meals and accommodation included. Payments can be made to our church account using the following reference, your name underscore prayer camp. Please sign up at the information desk or contact Auntie Barbara Jacobi. Our weekend ministry is having a winter clothing and blanket drive. Please partner with them this winter with warm winter clothing from newborns up to adults. Warm socks are especially welcomed for the winter chills. You can deliver your items to the church office. Our office hours are as follows. 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Thursday and 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Fridays. For further inquiries, please contact Auntie Katrina or Auntie Rita on the following numbers should you want to provide extra items on 081-842-3166 or 81 Visit our website for any additional information at ianvintuk.org. Let's commit to read, understand, believe, and obey the Word of God. Enjoy the service. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online broadcast. It's always a wonderful blessing to be able to come into your home or your car, wherever you are in your room watching this. And we believe that the Word of God is able to reach you even through this medium. Uh, today we're having some construction on site. You'll hear some of the noise in the background, but I trust that you'll be able to get the message and that we'll be able to fellowship together. Just an announcement pertaining to tomorrow is our usual day of prayer and fasting, but particularly for the men. It's the first Monday of every month. We have uh, men's prayer and the ladies will be down here at the bottom, the men at the top. So don't miss that because uh, as men, we are called definitely by God in order to stand uh, on the wall as watchmen for our families and for our cities. And so I want to encourage you, please prioritize that. And then also we have communion today. So get together your elements, your bread and your juice so that we're able to have communion together at the end of this message. Uh, speaking of the, the building, I want to encourage you also, if you're not yet partnering with us, please do join us. It is a work of God. It is not just a building. It is a means for God's purposes to be fulfilled in our nation. And so we want to invite you, whatever the Lord is leading you to, to give to the building fund, please do so. You should find the details of the building fund on our website and uh, also the information usually comes through our our broadcasts on YouTube as well. And we've got a vision to establish people in, in discipleship and not only for them to get born again. So if you've given your life to the Lord over the last few months, please do um, send us an email. If you're not yet connected or if you haven't been contacted yet, 
uh, please contact us so that we are able to get you involved in the discipleship in the small groups in the church. Awesome. So today we're starting with a new series. We culminated with our previous series on, on keys and principles of the kingdom last week. And today we're starting with a new series. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to get into the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word does not return void. And we thank you, Lord, that it is powerful, living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is able, Father God, to bring transformation and fulfill the will of God in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that even as we're sharing the word, that people will be healed, delivered, set free, saved, transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. So we're starting a new series called A Good Church. It's going to be a visit to Ephesus. It's going to be an expository look, a verse by verse uh, preaching of the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians is very enlightening concerning the importance of the church and what Christ has done and how the church operates. And as we go through the book of Ephesians over the next four weeks, in the first week today, we'll talk uh, about the introduction. We'll speak about Ephesus itself. We'll go a little bit to Acts chapter 9, where the Apostle Paul initially starts the church. And then we'll go on into Ephesians chapter 1, which deals specifically with that introduction from the Apostle Paul. And then in the second week, we'll speak about salvation and identity. That will cover chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Ephesians. And then in the third week, we'll speak about spiritual family and natural family, which will be covered over chapters 5, uh, 4, and 5 of the book of Ephesians. And then in the last week, we'll speak about spiritual war and victory, which is Ephesians chapter 6 as well. We also provided and uh, put together a reading plan for the church during this time. We want to encourage you to focus your reading of your scriptures in the book of Ephesians. You should be able to find a link to that in the description of this video. Uh, we will also distribute that at church. It will basically take us uh, on a daily basis through the book of Ephesians uh, in, in a couple of verses until the end of the month when we've read through the whole book. I want to encourage you that the Word of God is alive and it is able to transform you. If you take it seriously and plant it in your heart and you allow it to germinate, it will produce God's will in your life. And so let's be attentive as we go into this series called A Good Church. Now, in the beginning of the year, we made certain commitments, especially around the Word of God. We committed four things that we're going to read the Word of God, understand it. We're going to believe the Word of God and obey it. I hope that you've been committed to that and you've been reading your scriptures, your Bible on a daily basis. The statistics are out that people who read their Bible more than four times a week on a daily basis begin to experience tremendous levels of freedom, uh, overcoming temptation, any kinds of addictions, all kinds of uh, depression. Um, uh, there are so many benefits to the Word of God. And so we believe that God does want us not only to be topical in our preaching, but also go verse by verse at some times to look at certain books and just study them out as a church. So we're going to go through a lot of scripture, which for some might be foreign. There are preachers who just have one verse and they preach out of that. But because we want the scriptures to preach themselves, I will be going through the scriptures and just giving some narratives there. Now, why are we talking about this, a good church? And specifically, the church in Ephesus was really seen as, as an exemplary church. Even though in Revelations, it gets touched as well as one of the the, the churches that gets admonished by the Lord, but a good church can make all the difference in a city. One good church is able to bring the kingdom of God into a city and completely change the face and change the destiny of an entire city and even sometimes an entire nation. God can do tremendous things through one church, one good church. And it's not just about having a church in the city. You, it must be a good church. It must be a godly church, according to the tenets of scripture, according to the directives of the word of God. There are many churches out there that even today, shamefully, are accused of the most, the most bizarre criminal activities. 
and some of them are actually truly involved in those criminal activities. There are many false teachers and false apostles and false pastors and false prophets out there. And the enemy, the word of God says, also appears as an angel of light and his messengers as messengers of righteousness. And so it is important that we understand what is a good church because not only is it something that we ought to look for, it is something that we ought to become. Awesome. So we're going to go straight into the message right now. Just by way of background, Ephesus is a city back in the ancient world. It would nowadays be located in uh, present day Turkey, which is if you look at where, where northern Africa is across the Mediterranean Sea. If you go through Israel, it will go around this way. Just across from Egypt on the other side, you will find Ephesus. And it was one of the most important cities in Asia Minor. And it had a harbor that at the time opened into the Kesta River and it emptied itself into the Aegean Sea. And because it was also at an intersection of major trade routes connecting Europe with Asia and also with Africa, uh, Ephesus became a commercial center. It became this, this commercial hub, this, this metropolitan city that had so many cultures and so many different peoples coming through. It also boasted a pagan temple dedicated to the Roman goddess Diana, uh, or the Greek version would be Artemis. And these were pagan temples where men and women could come in and do all sorts of sexual immorality and there were priestesses that were prostitutes and you could come and make sacrifices to this idol called Diana or, or, or Artemis. And so Paul comes into the city in the book of Acts where we will go into and he establishes a church in this very godless city. And we'll see the power and the impact of the gospel and the simple preaching of the cross and repentance and how the Holy Spirit brought transformation even in this city. Awesome. All right. So, uh, the city and, 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 and the, 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 the place called Ephesus, um, obviously had a lot of need in terms of the gospel. And this is very common if we look around the world, even in Namibia, where we consider ourselves to be a Christian nation. I still think that there are elements of Namibia that are like Ephesus. I was walking in town just the other day, just two days ago, and people were painting a certain rainbow on the, on the sidewalk because uh, that, that specific location was going to be for the celebration of homosexuality or something like that. And so we are in times which are very similar to the time that the Apostle Paul was preaching in Ephesus. All right, so uh, turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 19. The scriptures will be on the, on the banner on the screen as well. And we're starting there from verse 1. I'm going to read through very quickly, just highlighting certain things. And then eventually we'll start in the book of Ephesus, the book of Ephesians chapter 1. So Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and ask them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? So we can see that there were already some disciples because of the dispersion that happened in Jerusalem through persecution. Some of the disciples actually already ended up in Ephesus. And so he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And there are many people that are like this, you know, they're, they're born again, but they have not even heard or receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, by the way, we're also celebrating Pentecost this Sunday, which was the day on, on which the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church and the disciples were speaking in tongues. So very, very timely, this verse here dealing with the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And then Paul asks, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And we'll pray for that as well at the end of the, 
of the message for those of you who haven't received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were all, they were about 12 men in all. Then verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue, still in Ephesus, and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. So he goes into the religious setting where the word is already being preached. This would be like church. And he preached the gospel boldly for three months and persuaded them, making arguments, obviously from the scriptures and uh, uh, about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, speaking about the kingdom of God. But some of them were obstinate or stubborn. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. The way. Here's the first time that we begin to see that Christianity at that time was not known as Christianity. It was known as the way. It was known as the way. It was only in Antioch later on that the believers were known as, as Christians or little Christs. But here they, they were known as the way. And people were already publicly uh, coming against uh, the way, which is Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And that's where it comes from. And so Paul left them and he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And so the apostle Paul is focused and deliberate about preaching the gospel, and those who believe will continue to spread the gospel. And he did it initially for three years, and then he did, he did it on for two years until the entire province was filled with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. We, we're still in Ephesus, and God is doing tremendous miracles because that is what the Word of God says. These signs will follow the preaching of the gospel, and there are miracles that follow to confirm that. Verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. And so what happened is there were things that the Apostle Paul was using, whether it be a handkerchief or the apron that he was using, and if he couldn't go and meet someone for prayer, he would just say, go, take this, put, the, put it on the person, and they would get healed, they would get delivered, and those things are still possible even today. We've heard many testimonies of this. Verse 13, some Jews went, who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. Now, in Judaism, there is also a form of exorcism or casting out demons, but they were not necessarily doing it in the name of Jesus until the preaching of Jesus came forth. And so these Jewish boys were uh, casting out evil spirits, invoking the name of Jesus, knowing that there is, there is power. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered him, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about. But who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And so uh, this is the powerful work that was being stirred up through the preaching of the gospel in Ephesus, through the demonstration of, of signs and wonders and miracles. And then others were also using this name because they started to be persuaded of the power of this name. And then in verse 17, we're still in Ephesus explaining how the church in Ephesus actually was established. And when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear because of what happened to those boys who were casting out evil spirits in the name of Jesus, who were beaten up by the evil spirit or the man possessed by the evil spirit. They were seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. In high honor. It's always the case when we preach the word boldly and we demonstrate the kingdom through signs and wonders and the Holy Spirit does that, that the name of Jesus will be held in high honor and the people who approach the church will approach the church with respect and fear. Verse 18, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery and witchcraft brought their scrolls and their books together and burned them publicly. 
Hallelujah, what a revival. And when, when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma. And so people were willing to give up their valuable witchcraft tokens and books because of the power of the kingdom of God that was coming into this city. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Grew in power. So the preaching that starts with one man, the apostle Paul, demonstrated with signs and wonders, begins to have this effect in the city that even those who are involved with other spiritual matters be, begin to be convicted to the point of burning those things, giving it up publicly, not hiding it, it's happening publicly, and the word of God begins to spread in the city and grow in power. Verse 21, after all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. And Paul was always aiming for Rome because he wanted to preach the gospel to the emperor. And he said, because the gospel is not just for for ordinary men, it's for everyone, men of high estate and every, every other person. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the, prov in the province of Asia a little longer. So he sends Timothy and Erastus ahead. And then he stays behind. And then he says, about that time there arose a great disturbance, once again, about the way. Remember, it wasn't called Christianity. Initially, it was called the way. Jesus is the way, the way to the Father, the way to eternal life. Verse 24, so there's a, a, a whole riot that's starting in the city of Ephesus. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business, after, uh, brought in a lot of business for the craft, craftsmen there. He called them together along with the workers of related trades and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business of the temple of Diana, the temple of Artemis. So they were making the paraphernalia for the temple, for the worship of this idol. And then he says, verse 26, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. Wow, what a ministry. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. <laughs> so Paul is preaching very boldly and he's saying, man, you guys are serving nonsense. There's only one God and he is Jesus. All this other thing, you are wasting your time. And the, the witch doctors and the sorcerers are already burning their books and people are no longer coming now to the temple to worship Artemis, to worship Diana. And so the guys who are doing business by selling those idols and shrines are now losing business. And so then in verse 27, they go on and said, there is a danger not only that our trade will lose its name, uh, its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. So these guys were obviously protecting this demonic goddess, this idol. And what was the thing that was dethroning Artemis? What was dethroning this idol? It wasn't that they were screaming in the sky and bringing down and say, calling down Artemis, come. Mm -mm. They were preaching the gospel. The preaching of the gospel converted the hearts of the people and the people turned away from their idolatry and the idol became nothing but a block of wood. And then we go on Acts chapter 19 verse 28. So they're, they're still scheming and discussing about this, this um, uh, controversy that Paul has brought into Ephesus through his preaching. And then it says, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis. So they started now to riot and rise up. Soon the whole city was in uproar and the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. The theater was like the town hall of the place where, where, where people would meet for important meetings. And Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province 
friends of Paul sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. So the, the riot was going on into this amphitheater. They already took uh, and seized Gaius and Aristarchus. Paul wasn't there. And they brought them into the theater almost to say, we're going to judge you guys and something's going to happen now. And Paul wanted to go and rescue them. So just imagine, we're talking about the book of, F, uh, of the Ephesians church. This is how the church was started. Such a run, the whole city is against the gospel because of the impact, the forceful impact of the gospel. And the friend said, please don't go there. But you know, Paul, <laughs> verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Some of the people did not even know why they were there. Interesting fact. 33, the Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. <laughs> Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis for two hours. These guys were committed. They were furious. They were offended. By what? By the effects of the gospel. The gospel can never only make people indifferent. No, it must either offend them or it must convert them. There's no middle way. It's either we are not preaching it right. If, if, if the gospel is not either offending people or causing them to come to Christ, then we are not preaching it boldly enough. We're not preaching against their idols enough. We're not preaching that Christ is the only way enough. If we do that, I'm telling you, all the demons of hell will provoke the people against the church. And that is when the light of, of, the, of the gospel shines even brighter. Then verse 35, the city clerk quieted the, the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image which fell from heaven? Hmm. So the government people are now speaking. Verse 36, therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to come down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have, have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and they are proconsuls, they can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. Thank God for, 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 for legal assemblies that can address these things because the riot, the people were about to destroy them. I, I, I saw in the news just the other day, this young lady, I think she was 18, Northern Nigeria, she was clubbed to death by some, some colleagues at a university because they were Muslims and it, they, they said that she blasphemed the prophet. And so they, they, they beat her to death and burnt her body. So these things are still happening today. Maybe not in Namibia, but definitely in, in the world right now. And the gospel must be preached, even in the face of such adversity. The gospel must be preached. It's the only way for salvation for those who believe. Verse 40, as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. So the clerk is explaining to them, guys, let's do this the legal way. We know that Artemis is the greatest and, and Ephesus protects her temple and all of that. And these guys haven't stolen anything or whatnot. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So very amazing how um, the preaching of the gospel brings about this kind of revolt. Then we go on to chapter 20, just skipping a couple of verses for the sake of time. You can read it in your own Bible. But just to show uh, what, what, what happens to Paul and when he leaves Ephesus. Verse 17 is chapter 20, verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to, to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And so at that point, the, the, the church already had elders in place. And Timothy and Titus, uh, the book of Timothy and Titus explained the qualifications for that. Verse 18, when the elders arrived, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. 
I serve the Lord with great humility. Consider here how the church is supposed to break open cities. I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. This is why we believe in Connect Group. House to house. The gospel can't just be preached on Sunday. It must be preached daily from house to house. And then he says in verse 21, I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he wasn't preaching about my best life now and how to get money from God and all. No, he was preaching that people must repent to God and turn Turn from their sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Very telling because he's explaining and, 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 and retracting his steps and explaining what happened when he came to Ephesus and explaining this to the elders of the church in Ephesus. And then Acts chapter 20 verse 22, he continues and says, And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Explaining how Paul was doing his missionary journeys, being led by the Holy Spirit. Not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. He eventually writes to the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians from that prison. Verse 24, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the gospel will ever see me again. Look at the conviction of this man. Even though he used to persecute the church in his other life, he got born again and then he lived fully preaching the gospel. At risk, at pains, it doesn't matter because Jesus sent him. Then he says to them in verse uh, 26, Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. <laughs> For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will, the whole counsel of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers and elders. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Very important revelation that's coming through there from the Apostle Paul. Then he continues, verse 29, I know that after I leave, he's telling these elders, after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. And it's happening in churches today. Savage wolves, because elders are not doing their jobs. Elders are not protecting the flock. Even from your own number, among you guys, <laughs> men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. Not after Christ, but after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I've never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. What does it take for a church like the Ephesians church to be established in the city of Ephesus, a, a, a city that is for idol worship? This is what it takes. It takes disciples, believers, ministers, and elders who are committed to the gospel, who are committed to God at their own expense, willing to be sacrificed so that the church can be birthed in that city. Verse 32, now I commit you, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Just imagine, Paul, while in Ephesus, he wasn't taking gifts from the church and, and tithes and offerings. He was giving himself to the preaching of the gospel. And when he had time, he would make tents. He would, he would, he would, so that people don't say, yeah, he's just trying to do it for financial gain. No. 
and I, I believe that definitely pastors and preachers and teachers and, and, and people who work for the church should be taken care of by the church. The word of God is very clear on that. But the apostle Paul didn't want them to use that as an argument. Can you imagine the, the resolve it takes in order to establish the church? It doesn't matter. I, I, I have a job. It doesn't matter. I, I, I don't have a job. It doesn't matter. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm called in, into this. I'm, I'm not a minister. It doesn't matter. The preaching of the gospel is essential because the kingdom of God is at hand and it must be preached. And once it is preached, it will birth the church in a city even like Ephesus. And then he says in verse 36 on to 38, he says, When Paul finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. Look at the fellowship. Look at the love between the church. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. And off he is on his way to prison, on his way to persecution, on his way to preaching the gospel all the way to the emperor in Rome. Awesome. So this is... In Acts, the narrative of how the church of Ephesus, the Ephesian church, was birthed. And his last engagement is here with the elders. And so later on, he does get in prison and he writes them the letter, the epistle, which is the letter that we're going to go through over the next four weeks, which is the letter to the Ephesians. Now, I'm going to go through chapter one. I've done this introduction we're going to go through chapter one, highlighting some of the key things. But just keep in the back of your mind this introduction of how things were established in Ephesus and how the elders were commissioned with that final word. And now this message is coming to the church and the revelation that the Apostle Paul wants this kind of church to have. It's a good church. Ephesians chapter one, from verse one, he says, Paul, an apostle, of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Always in his messages he says, from God you have favor. From God you have peace. With Jesus you have favor. With God you have peace. It is so important that as a church we feel that favor from God. We feel that peace of the Lord Jesus Christ with us. Then in verse 3, look at this tremendous verse. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So the church is blessed with what? With every spiritual blessing. The church ought not to pray for blessings. The church ought to work out the blessing that is already in the church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, in Christ, with every spiritual blessing. And this is not just blessings that cannot materialize. Spiritual blessings are the foundation for, for natural blessings. If you consider how God created the earth, it said that he created this and then he blessed them. And it said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And so it was the blessing of God that caused Adam and Eve to prosper and to be fruitful and to multiply. So spiritual blessings cause natural effects. And so if the church believes and is acquainted with the spiritual blessings that are in Christ, it will begin to produce it in the city. Hallelujah. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So the believer is selected by God. God is the one that chooses us for salvation, ordains us to be conformed into the image of Christ, to be part of his family. And he does this in his predestination, in his plan, and he wants us to be holy and blameless before him. And so how does he do that? Through the blood of Christ, through the cross of Christ, through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Then verse 5, in love he predestined us, here we go, for adoption to himself as sons, not servants, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, 
to the praise of his glorious grace so that we can say, wow, how gracious God is and with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The beloved is Christ. And so the word of God says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The church is the body of the beloved. The, Jesus is the head. The church is the body. We are loved the same way that God loves the head. He loves the body because it's his son. It's his bride. And so the church ought to feel this favor, this love, this compassion from God. The same way that God loves the son, he loves the church. Hallelujah. In him, in the son, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption. We've been bought from our slavery through his blood, the forgiveness of sins of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He poured out his, his, his grace. He poured out mercy on us that we didn't deserve. And it wasn't because God was being reckless. It was because it was his wisdom that led him to be gracious towards us. Instead of judging us, he judged his son. That was the wisdom of God that in the son, he would bless the whole world. And so that wisdom brought about the riches of his grace lavish washing upon us hallelujah verse 9 making known to us the mystery of his will what is the mystery of his will it's the mystery that for for many generations through the prophets they couldn't see what is this plan of God the mystery of his will according to his purpose which is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time or the end of time to unite all things in him, in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. The mystery was how was God going to reconcile things back to himself? And he did this in Christ and Christ in us is the hope of glory. Verse 11, in him we have, hallelujah, I love the tenses in this chapter. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Why? Because we are now sons and daughters having been predestined according to his purpose, to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You and I, our lives are for the glory of God forever. This is why we live. Everything about us shouts to the cosmos, shouts to the angelic, shouts to the demonic that God is glorious. Look at what he's done in his sons and his daughters. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, remember he's now reminiscing how we read in Acts, how he started this church. He said, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed, were closed, were locked in with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. God gave us his Holy Spirit and sealed us in the Holy Spirit, covered us in the Holy Spirit, closed us, locked us in the Holy Spirit. And that is a deposit, that is the down payment to show that one day we will even receive our glorified bodies and will be completely perfect as Jesus is. Verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Hallelujah. For us as leaders, we ought to pray for our people and pray for the church. And this is the prayer. And this is the prayer that you can also pray for. your Whoever you pray for who is a believer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, may give to them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Meaning the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him. To know Jesus, having the eyes of your heart enlightened or full of light, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe 
according to the working of his great might. Hallelujah. And he goes on to expand on that. And so this is what we ought to pray for one another, that we have wisdom and understanding and revelation in knowing Christ, in knowing the riches of his grace, so that we will know what hope we have. A, a Christian who is sad and depressed is ignorant. That's all. It's ignorance. It's just because you don't know how much you are loved. You don't understand what Christ has done for you on the cross. You don't understand the grace and peace of God towards you. If you knew that, some of you who are sick would be healed instantly. The revelation materializes in the natural because our faith locks into the promise. Verse 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us? Immeasurable power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule. This is the kind of power towards us. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's the same power that worked the resurrection and the ascension. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is the kind of power that is in the church. It's the power that brought about the resurrection of Christ. It's the power that brought about the ascension of Christ and has put him far above, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but in the age to come. And it says, and he put all things under his feet, under the feet of Jesus and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Hallelujah. And there we come to the end of it. What is the church? It is the body of Christ and it is it is filled with the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. This is why the church is the answer for the world. The church is the answer for our city. The church is the answer for our nation. The church is the answer for our families. The church is the answer for our government. The church is the answer for every problem. Why? Because in the church is where the fulfillment of God's mysterious revelation is, that Christ is going to work in the nations, work in the city, work in the lost, work in our families, work in our friends, through the church. The, the, the church is the vehicle, is the hands, is the feet that God uses to impact every place and to reconcile every nation and the whole universe to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What Jesus has done is tremendous. And the enemy tries his best to make it as if it's just someone dying on the cross. No, the wisdom of God was that he was substituting himself with us. So that if Jesus is on the cross, then we are seated at the table of the Father. If Jesus is receiving curses, then we are receiving blessings. If Jesus is re rejected, then we are being accepted. If Jesus is being mocked and beaten and tortured, then we are being healed and being blessed. And so God's plan and God's purpose is not somewhere in heaven. <laughs> it is here on earth, in his bride, in his church, in his people, in the saints. Hallelujah. And the saints better stand up, better rise up, you know, arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us, upon you. God is not going to come on his own and heal the sick. God is not going to come on his own to preach the gospel. He's not going to come on his own to change our city. We are the ones whom God has sent. And Ephesians is going to prove this as we go through the rest of the book. Hallelujah. I want to pray for us, but first we're going to have some communion as we remember what Christ has done for us. The Bible says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And this is the healing. This is the power of God for restoration. There are so many testimonies of people that got healed by taking the communion like a prescription three times a day, every time the same day, praying, and they got healed of cancer. They got healed of autoimmune diseases. They got healed 
of depression, all sorts of conditions. And so as we're partaking of the bread, don't take it only as bread. Consider that this is the body that was broken for you. Respect it in that way. And then your faith will lock in with the virtue that is flowing from this. Let us partake of the bread. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Jesus. By his stripes, we were healed and made whole. Jesus. And then the Bible says that he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. A covenant proves that God will never ever leave us nor forsake us. He didn't just come to us for a relationship. He married us and he's not a God of divorce. And so this blood proves that it is over the dead body of Christ <laughs> that we were brought in. And his resurrection completely brought our justification. Before God, we stand innocent because Jesus is raised from the dead and his blood washed us. So right now, if in your conscience, you are struggling with any kind of pattern of addictions, any kind of sin, you can be free right now by repenting of your sin. Put your faith not in your own willpower and ability and discipline. Put your faith that there's a blood that cleanses wider than snow. I see someone in my heart right now. It's like you, you used to be in prison and you were set free, but you have a criminal record and you feel a call towards the ministry. And God is saying in heaven, you don't have a criminal record. In heaven, because you're born again, your slate is clean. Go and preach the gospel. God is going to use you mightily. Hallelujah. Father, we partake of this blood. We thank you. There's no other blood that speaks for us, Lord. This blood speaks mercy and forgiveness and justification, cleansing and purity and holiness for us in Jesus' name. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, as we are going to read through the book of Ephesians, Father, speak to us, transform our hearts and rise up, raise up your church, Lord God, to be the instrument of transformation in our city and in our nation and in the nations of the world. We honor you and we thank you in Jesus' name. If you're out there, you're not born again, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you right where you are, pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you just as I am. I know that I'm a sinner. I ask that you come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. I believe that you died for me on the cross. And three days later, you were raised from the dead. You are alive, Lord Jesus. I receive eternal life from you right now. I receive forgiveness of sins right now. And I'm welcome into the church and into the family of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. You prayed that from your heart. Something new is happening in your life. Please contact us. The details will be on this video. And we want to hear from you. May God bless you. May you continue to be in the word. Remember, this world is going to hell. <laughs> Rescue yourself out like, like Noah and his family in the ark. Make sure that you are not part of the perversities of this generation. Jesus came to seek and save the lost and to give you eternal and abundant life. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.